According to the World Health Organization, liver cancer is the second most common cause of cancer death worldwide, and death rates have been steadily on the rise since the 1980s. The options and treatments for patients with advanced liver cancer are very limited, with the overall five-year survival rate this year at 17%. Join us today as we meet with experts in the field of oncology and discover how a new investigational treatment option for patients with advanced liver cancer is making the rounds. I'm Erica Petrini. Access Health starts right now. Everybody has kind of that intellectual acceptance that they're, they're actually dying. There's no doubt at the end that's gonna happen. I just had a clearer perspective of like, it was gonna be happening to me sooner. My name is Conrad DeBrat. I've been married to my wife, Lisa, for 18 years. I'm 51 years old. I live in Smithfield, Virginia. I was a little surfer kid, you know, kind of nerdy, but um, growing up in San Diego, it's one of those things that you always have the beach there, and either you learn how to surf or you find other things that, to keep you occupied, but everyone's always at the beach. Just love the ocean. Went to a baseball game, and there was a blood drive, and I went to go donate blood, and was informed about a week or two later, they said, well, we can't use your blood, and you have hepatitis C. If you don't show any symptoms or anything, you would never know. 18 years ago, there wasn't even really that much advanced treatment at that time. One of the things about hep C is that it affects your liver. We knew I had cirrhosis, and it does affect your liver. It did damage my liver. Pretty much everybody that I've heard of and what they've told me, anybody that has hep C and cirrhosis for a long period of time eventually develops liver cancer. When you have a chronic illness, you do not become complacent with it. We had a routine scans, and then they showed a spot, and we did a biopsy, and it turned out it was cancer, and did a resection of that area, got rid of the cancer in that area, but at the same time, they showed what looked like it could be something else in my lungs as well. Well, the doctor said that, you know, you're stage four. They said, I hate telling you this. This is the last news I wanted to tell you. But this is it, you know, basically. When you first hear about it, it's devastating. I, I cried like a baby. And now it wasn't so much for me, but it was for Lisa. Because she was gonna be alone, you know? Options for patients like Conrad with advanced liver cancer are currently very limited and there remains an unmet medical need for thousands of patients and their families. Fortunately, there are certain novel therapies currently in clinical trials that offer hope and if effective, the promise of additional treatment options. It is known as a type of oncolytic immunotherapy which involves harnessing our body's own immune system to fight cancer. Joining me today to help navigate the latest information is Dr. Laura K. Findice, Chair of the Department of Radiology at the University of Tennessee Medical Center. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Erica. So there's a lot of information out there. Let's start with the basics. What is primary liver cancer? Primary liver cancer is simply cancer that starts in the liver. It's called hepatocellular carcinoma, the most common type of liver cancer, which basically just means liver cell cancer. Mm -hmm. We call it HCC. There are multiple types of patterns of liver cancer. So liver cancer can develop as multiple small tumors within the liver. It can develop as a single big tumor in the liver. It can start as a small tumor and then grow big. This is important because it impacts the types of therapies that we can offer patients. So we're going to talk a little bit about early detection, but first let's talk about risk factors associated with HCC. What are they? The most common risk factor for HCC is cirrhosis or damage to the liver. For the most common cause of cirrhosis in the United States and North America is alcoholism. Mm -hmm. We also have viral hepatitis, and so there are two types of viral hepatitis that are important, hepatitis C and hepatitis B. Hepatitis C is the most common. The 
most rapidly increasing segment of the population with HCC is patients with fatty livers. Obesity, diabetes are known to be independent risk factors mm -hmm. for HCC, and it's because of development of fatty liver. So now that we've identified the risk factors, let's talk about early detection. Is that possible with HCC? It is a possibility. The patients that we will screen for hepatocellular carcinoma are patients that are already known to be at risk. So we don't screen everybody. Mm -hmm. Really, screening procedures are just ultrasound of the liver every six months to look for those early nodules that are the sign of HCC. The reason it's important for those populations because of their very high risk is if we can find those tumors early, the options for treatment are much better. Speaking of treatment, I know there's not been a whole lot of hope in this space until now. I know, doctor, that you're involved with a ton of research and some clinical trials regarding the treatment of HCC. It's true, Erica. There have been some really great developments, and I'm really excited to be able to share those with you. Let's take a short break. We'll come right back with Dr. Findice, talk treatments, and check in with one very special patient. If you can resign yourself to die, you can resign yourself to working hard to live. Before the break, we were speaking about treatment options for advanced primary liver cancer, or HCC. Doctor, can we break down some of the conventional treatments for HCC? Most patients, if they have a smaller contained tumor or just very few tumors, will actually recommend transplant. You always hear that, you know, that the liver can regenerate itself. Mm -hmm. Well, the liver tries to regenerate itself, it tries to fix itself. And so there's a lot of cell turnover that's happening there, and cell turnover can cause a bad cell and a bad cell can then become a cancer. Once your liver starts making tumors, your entire liver is at it's risk compromised. of making tumors. You're not eligible for transplant. There are other therapies that we can do. So if you have a small localized tumor that's kind of on the edge of the liver, a lot of those can be cut out surgically. The next step, if a patient's not eligible for surgery or if their liver's not healthy enough to, to have a surgery, what we can do is, is ablation. So ablation is where we actually take a long needle through the skin, straight into the liver using CT guidance, and use that probe to either heat or freeze the tumor to kill it. If you can't undergo an ablation, would be to go undergo another type of liver-directed therapy, either chemoembolization or radioembolization. Chemoembolization is delivery of small beads into the circulation that goes to the tumor, mm -hmm. and those beads have chemotherapy attached to them. It allows us to cut off the blood supply to the tumor and then also deliver a very high dose of um, chemotherapy to the tumor at that site. And then next in line is radioembolization, which is also beads delivered through the circulation to the tumor, but delivering a very high dose of radiation. So the beads themselves have radiation on them. If local regional therapies don't work, or if a patient's just not eligible for local regional therapies, there is a single oral chemotherapy agent called serafinib mm -hmm. that patients can take that's been shown to provide some survival benefit. Okay, so simply put, local regional therapy is when we administer the treatment directly to the cancer cells or the surrounding area. Yeah, that's right, Erica. It's actually a relatively new specialty. Interventional radiology or interventional oncology uh, is a specialty where we use image guidance, so CT, ultrasound, x-ray, to navigate tools through the body directly to our targets to deliver therapy. Access Health recently visited with Dr. Ricardo Lencioni at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center in Miami, Florida to learn more about localized treatments for liver cancer. So interventional oncology includes all minimally invasive therapies that are currently used to treat cancer. So the common denominators for this new branch of medicine are the use of a minimally invasive approach with minimal discomfort for the patient. The use of sophisticated imaging guidance that will allow precise targeting of tumors. This branch of medicine is now recognized as uh, the fourth pillar in cancer care, along with the medical oncology, the use of drugs, surgical oncology, and radiation oncology. Dr. Lencioni has been at the forefront of interventional oncology since its early application in the 90s and is heralded for his work in liver cancer as well as clinical trials. He recently joined the team of world-renowned experts at Sylvester to continue his contributions to this new age of cancer care that is designed to complement or work along with existing treatment options. So years ago, the use of uh, image guided ablation was mostly relying uh, on ultrasound guidance or CT guidance 
So basically, imaging techniques that allows you to see the tumor and localize the tumor, but not really to guide uh, precisely in a 3D your device into the target. Currently, we have a variety of uh, navigation tools, what we call the medical GPS. And this would simplify tremendously our job. And uh, the concept of uh, oncolytic viral immunotherapy is a game changer because you will be able to attack and destroy the cancer under the same uh, minimal invasive approach, but at the same time inducing uh, an immune reaction that will be systemic, meaning that the immune system will be able to attack and hopefully clear any other tumor cell anywhere in the body. We'll hear more from Dr. Lencioni in just a little bit. This is exactly why I love doing this show. There's so many advancements happening in medicine and science, lots to talk about. For instance, in the news right now, we're hearing a lot about immunotherapy. Doctor, can you kind of break down what is immunotherapy and how it's applied to oncology? Immunotherapy really gives us a, a novel way to approach treating cancer cells. Like we talked about before, we've had local regional therapies that, that treat the area of the tumor. And then with chemotherapy, we've had the ability to treat cell turnover, but it's been very nonspecific to the tumor cells themselves. And now we can actually train the immune system to recognize tumor cells, remember tumor cells, and then kill those tumor cells wherever they are. And what types of immunotherapies are being used to specifically to fight HCC? We can take cells out of your tumors, immune cells specifically out of the tumors, grow them in a lab, put them back into your body and use those cells to attack the cancer. Monoclonal antibody therapy where we develop specific antibodies to tumor surface features so that the, the antibodies will actually go into the body, recognize the tumor, attach themselves to the tumor and make that tumor a target, either kill the tumor or invite other cells from your body to come and attack the tumor. There are cancer vaccines. There's a vaccine against hepatitis B that's a preventive vaccine against hepatocellular carcinoma, which has been used for many years. But there are also treatment vaccines, and that's where this gets really exciting. So we deliver our agents to the region of the tumor, but we're still treating the area of the tumor. And with chemotherapy, you know, we're treating cells all over the body. And so one of the reasons that chemotherapy is so difficult for people to go through is we're not only killing cancer mm -hmm. cells, we're killing normal cells too, and that's what causes the side effects. And this is why immunotherapy is so important. Now, you're involved in a clinical trial right now for HCC using this exact process um, at UT. Can you tell us a little bit more about the clinical trial? I'm the principal investigator for our site on a trial called the FOCUS trial, which is a trial looking at Pexivec, which is an oncolytic virus, looking at whether it'll improve survival and quality of life in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, we're looking at the agent, comparing serafinib alone to use of this agent plus serafinib. And Conrad, who we met earlier, was at the heart of this trial. Conrad was the, the first subject in North America to be injected with the agent on the trial. Conrad is in excellent health, and Conrad hadn't been exposed to serafinib yet. He hadn't been given serafinib, so he hadn't had systemic therapy, and that's a mandatory for the trial to be included. So it was a huge stroke of luck for us and for him. And he has just a tremendous spirit. And before we take a little break, I want to check back in with Conrad for more of his story. They were talking about starting me on an oral chemo regimen, and it, it what it does is it would prolong my life to a certain extent. So I was taking trips back to California to see my family and friends. And Lisa didn't come with me at that point. And she had been here researching HCC on the internet. And when I came back from California, Lisa said, I found something. And it was the study, phase three trial at University of Tennessee Medical Center. And we went out there just to check it out. It turned out I was a really good candidate. It was hope. That's the one thing. Before, there wasn't. There was just extension. It was better than the alternative, which was nothing. Coming up. The need to truly offer to patients treatments that are efficacious, safe, but at the same time, they preserve their quality of life. We're back with Dr. Laura Finn Dice, and we're talking about immunotherapy and how that is being applied to a worldwide phase three clinical trial. 
Doctor, can you first break down exactly how a clinical trial works? When applying for FDA approval for an agent, there's a series of steps to go through. There's phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. Phase one and phase two trials are really focused on safety of the agent, basic effectiveness of the agent, optimizing the dosing of the agent. And the focus trial has now in phase three, so that must mean that it's showing some promise. Well, it means it's shown enough promise that we can now offer it to patients with disease and then compare the outcomes to the current standard of care therapy. You know, the goal of this trial really is to, to determine whether we can improve long-term outcomes in patients who have hepatocellular carcinoma. It's vitally important that each and every cancer patient be given the tools they need to improve their survival. Here's more from Dr. Lencioni in Miami. So this field of uh, interventional oncology has undergone a dramatic evolution over the past few years. I was actually the founding chairman of the Society of Interventional Oncology and, uh, and truly with the advances in imaging and technology, the ability to precisely target and kill tumors has improved dramatically. The procedure to administer Paxavac uh, is actually quite simple because essentially it follows exactly the same rule that we would do for any biopsy. We have a specific device called the quadrifuse, uh, which is uh, a needle with multiple holes, and then we will place the needle, uh, again by using uh, state-of-the-art imaging, uh, precisely into the tumor, avoiding, of course, any critical structures that are located in the vicinity of the tumor and then we will inject the virus into the tumor. Once the needle is precisely located inside the tumor, we can uh, deploy the tines that will come out from the cannula, and then we will uh, slowly inject uh, the solution containing the Paxavac virus. Paxavac has been shown to be safe. The phase two has also been completed. This was published in Nature Medicine uh, uh, two years ago and uh, these confirmed that patients who received uh, intratumoral injection of Paxavac had a much prolonged tumor control and much prolonged survival. And this was the basis to design now the ongoing phase three study. And on that note, let's check in with Conrad and see how things are going. You know, Dr. Findice comes in and she's wearing basically her superhero suit, you know, with all the protective gear on it and everything like that. And she comes up, gives me a pat on the shoulder, and she goes, okay, we're gonna do this. Once every three weeks, we would just drive out Sunday, and then we'd have the scans and, and the doctor's visits and the blood work. Chemotherapy is no joke, and even if it's just an oral chemo. And then having the fever of the injections and everything like that was pretty intense for a day but they were different side effects. Like, oh, my joints hurt today or something like that. And then three days later, you don't have those pains. And you go, oh, that was a side effect. I wanna make a difference. I knew that this had an opportunity to be something really great for me and other people, you know? I'm part of a study that's gonna help people in the future. I get to spend more time with my wife, with my friends that I love, my family. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for her. Why not go for it? Well, doctor, it sounds like the FOCUS trial is a huge step in the right direction, potentially changing the landscape for the treatment of HCC. Well, Erica, that's the goal. You know, the, the field of oncology has changed so much. Even in my own career, watching cancer become a diagnosis that was a short-term death sentence to seeing patients who live with cancer for years as a chronic condition has been so exciting. I, I feel really fortunate to be part of this right now. I feel like we're standing on the brink of this incredible understanding of how to treat cancer in a whole different way, and it's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Dr. Findice, for sharing your time with us, and thank you also to Dr. Lencioni and especially Conrad for sharing his personal story. For more information on the Focus Clinical Trial, visit pexavectrials.com, and of course, you can log on to our website at accesshealth.tv. See you next time.